Welcome to the eighth lecture of modern construction materials. In the previous lecture, we had looked at how materials respond to stress and today we will talk about failure theories. We will look at what kind of criteria we have to use for determining when a material will fail under multi-axial stresses. I start with this picture of a temple in Halabid, Karnataka, which has survived since the 12th century and we see in the picture a lot of nice stone columns which have survived, taken the load for many, many hundreds of years and have not failed. What do we consider as failure? So, a structural material is considered to have failed when it can no longer perform its design function and in this case we are talking about mechanical aspects. Failure may occur in two ways, complete fracture that is brittle failure or rupture when an element or structure breaks apart. Failure can also be considered as excessive deformation that is the structure or element deforms so much that though it does not rupture or break, the deformation is such that it cannot be used for what it has been designed for. That is something that we can call ductile failure as opposed to brittle failure in the first case. Now, when we have to study failure and determine when a material fails, under uniaxial loading it is pretty simple. We look at the stress strain curve and this stress strain curve when drawn uh, up to failure can tell us how a material will respond to stress and when the material will fail and how it will fail. Under multi-axial stresses, it is more complicated to visualize and therefore, failure theories are needed for representing the material behavior and this is usually done for metals based on plasticity or yielding and in other materials plasticity may be combined with fracture. When we look at the uniaxial behavior of a metal, say in tension, we can get different types of behaviors when we compare different materials. The top curve here is for mild steel where we have a elastic response, a linear elastic response culminating in what is called the proportionality limit or the elastic limit in this case both coincide. Then we have a yield plateau, then there is hardening and at this point D which is the maximum stress, we have necking occurring. Now, the neck starts to develop and finally, you have failure. In the case of aluminum, we find that there is no definite point where we can identify the yielding or the proportionality yielding to start or the proportionality to complete, it is somewhere here. So, in order to define an yield point objectively, what is done for materials such as this where we do not have a clear well defined yield point like we had in uh, mild steel is that a 0.2 percent offset is taken. That is a line is drawn parallel to the initial slope at a strain of 0.2 percent and wherever it intersects is taken as the yield point. This is classical of polycrystalline materials which have different grains yielding at different points in time and this we have discussed in detail in some of the previous lectures. We can also have some metals which do not undergo significant yielding or necking and failure like in the case of cast iron. Again we saw in previous lectures that cast iron was a brittle material and we have a slightly curved behavior instead of a linear elastic uh, behavior. We can say that the proportionality limit is somewhere here in this region where the curve stops being linear and then again an elastic limit could be somewhere here and then failure. In this case, we do not really define the different regions like we had in the case of mild steel. 
So, what is clear is that between metals itself the behavior can vary significantly. The tensile behavior is also used to determine how a material should be processed. Going back to the behavior of mild steel, say in the case of a hot rolled steel, we have this type of behavior that we just discussed. We have elastic behavior signified by a linear elastic range followed by the onset of yielding, the upper yield limit, then we have a lower yield limit. Uh, stable necking occurring, strain hardening, we have the peak here and then we have failure, complete rupture occurring at a strain which can be given a name of epsilon which can be called epsilon f for failure. Now, instead of looking at the hot roll steel behavior. If we were to think of a cold roll steel, what has happened in the cold roll steel is that this material that we have in the upper diagram was loaded to a certain point and then unloaded that is what you see here. So, the hot roll behavior is this, but what has happened is that in cold rolling we have deformed the material to a certain extent unloaded and this new material now is the cold roll steel. And if we were to determine the tensile behavior of the cold roll steel, we will now have an elastic part starting from the 0 reference stress strain and then here we will have yield, then necking and rupture. So, we need this behavior to determine how much of cold working has to be done, so that we get the desired yield value and also have a sufficient amount of elongation before failure. So, the knowledge of this behavior is not only needed for design, but also for processing. The complete stress strain behavior under all sorts of loading conditions is difficult to model, it is quite complex. In this diagram that you have in the screen, we put together different types of loading conditions and how the material can respond. This is to understand that the behavior is quite complex, a single, single simple model may not be sufficient to explain all the possible scenarios. In this case, we have linear elastic behavior, then if we continue and unload, you will have a certain loading. Unloading generally this will have the same slope as the initial part of the curve and then if we go on and say we hold stress, say from this point, this point we are holding stress constant. Now, due to creep that we studied before, the strain will continue to increase. So, here you need a model which looks at creep also. Then if we continue and we come to a certain point and we hold the strain constant, that is we are holding strain constant, we will see now that the stress drops, this is called relaxation. This has mechanisms similar to creep, but here what we are doing is looking at the behavior when strain is held constant instead of stress being held constant in creep in relaxation, we have strain being held constant and now the stress relaxes or the stress drops. In along this part, in any case that we unload beyond the elastic regime, we will have a permanent strain. So, whichever model is needed for the plastic part has to correctly look at how permanent strain occurs. Then we can also have fatigue, we looked at cyclic loading in the previous lecture and we have to see what sort of a stress strain diagram we have when the stress is cycled. This is called a hysteresis loop. So, the behavior in elastic regime is quite complex, many phenomena can intervene and therefore, we need complex models 
and simple models are not sufficient. Let us look at a material that does not have ductile failure say rock or concrete. We would have a stress strain diagram this time may be looking more at compression rather than tension because these materials are generally weak in tension and we use them more in compression. So, if we were to test a specimen of concrete under uniaxial compression, we will have initially a small nonlinear part which can be attributed to the closure of pores to the settling of the boundaries under the load. Then we have an elastic part. This is where we will expect the material to be under service conditions. The slope of this is the Young's modulus. Then damage is initiated, defects which occur in the material slowly propagate, there is micro cracking and this is called the pre-peak nonlinear region where we have distributed micro cracking occurring. At a certain point of strain, the micro cracks coalesce, localize, larger cracks start forming, the cracks link and the load carrying capacity comes down. In a rock, this is where the joints set, the joints start opening up. Then you have major cracking or faulting, large strains occur and then you have failure. This part of the curve may also depend on the stiffness of the testing machine or of the surroundings in general. Getting a unique objective post peak part in these materials is sometimes very difficult. This behavior where the stress drops after a peak is called softening as opposed to what we saw in metals where the curve goes up and we call it strain hardening, this is called strain softening. So, any behavior that is below a plastic plateau is brittle and it is called strain softening and what is above a plastic flat behavior is called strain hardening. And as I said materials such as concrete, rock, ceramics exhibit such type of nonlinearity where we have a post peak drop in stress as strain increases and this is called strain softening. Now, plastic stress strain curves can be idealized for modeling and these are the different models that are often used. On the left top we have a rigid perfectly plastic model where instead of a finite elastic modulus we have a rigid material a elastic an elastic modulus that is infinite. Then we have the plastic part and unloading reloading is now vertical. And the plateau starts at the stress equal to the yield strength. This may be more realistic the curve on the top right where we have an elastic part both in compression and in tension. Then we have the plateau occurring at the yield strength, the initial slope is given by the Young's modulus and unloading reloading follows the slope of the Young's modulus. Hardening behavior can be modeled by these two curves at the bottom with a bilinear behavior signified represented by two slopes E and H or you can have a power law type hardening where we have a curved behavior. When we look at multi axial loading we have to uh, remember remind ourselves of principal stresses and principal directions and if you go back to strength of materials you would have studied that under every stress state there are three principal directions orthogonal to each other that is right angles to each other along which the principal stresses act. Each principal stress represents the maximum or minimum normal stress 
for one set of plane stresses. Along those principal planes, we do not have any shear stresses, we have only axial stresses. The principal stresses are usually designated as sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Considering tension as positive, sigma 1 would be the maximum principal stress, sigma 3 would be the minimum principal stress. The maximum shear stress in the body is given by the difference between the maximum and the minimum principal stresses divided by 2. So, tau max is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. In the case of hydrostatic pressure, when we have hydrostatic compression, the pressure on the body is the same in all directions. That is, it is always normal to any surface on which it acts. Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 are all equal, equal to minus p, which is the pressure, and therefore, no shearing is possible. So, we can we will not be able to have any shear stress when a material is under hydrostatic compression. So, this means that failure due to shearing will not occur in under hydrostatic compression. And this goes back to when we lo started looking at the Condon Moore's diagram and we said that failure cannot occur under pure compression, because the atoms as they are pushed together have very high repulsive forces and we have a behavior like what we see here. As the pressure is increased, as the hydrostatic pressure is increased, the atoms are pulled to get, pushed together. So, that is the strain is increasing, atoms are pushed together, re the repulsive forces increase and at very high pressures, we find that the curve between hydrostatic pressure and volumetric strain actually starts going upward due to the nonlinearity that we saw in the interatomic bond going back to the Condon Morse diagram. So, here there is lot of repulsion and the we enter into the regime where the bonds are behaving in a nonlinear manner. The slope of this line is the bulk modulus k. In some cases, however, we can have this curve instead of going up, going down, where this that would indicate a collapse of the microstructure. That is, uh, if you have a lot of pores in the material, these pores can collapse due to the very high hydrostatic pressure that is being applied. Coming back to biaxial stress states and the principal stresses and principal planes, suppose we have a point O around at which we are applying this very generic stress state given by the different normal stresses and the shear stresses, we would find that there will be a set of planes on which the principal stresses act sigma 1 and sigma 2. This is a case of plane stress. So, we are looking at something like a thin plate where sigma 3 is equal to 0 for simplicity but the same ideas apply to all multiaxial behavior. So, the principal stresses are now sigma 1 and sigma 2 and you see that on the principal planes we do not have any shear stresses. Now, how do we use this concept to determine failure? There are different failure criteria. The first one and most simple is the maximum principal stress criterion or the Rankine theory. According to the Rankine theory, Yielding begins when the maximum principal stress reaches a value equal to the tensile or compressive yield stress under uniaxial tension or compression. That is, yielding in any state will occur when the principal stress reaches the value corresponding to yield in the uniaxial case. And in the uniaxial case, now we know that yielding will occur when the stress reaches the yield strength. So, what we are saying is under a biaxial stress state, as long as, as soon as the maximum principal stress reaches the yield strength, yielding will occur under any state. 
So, according to the Rankine theory yielding occurs when the maximum principal stress reaches the value of the yield strength. And this is represented by this yield surface which says that as long as the stress state is within this surface defined by sigma 1 equal to y sigma 2 equal to y on, on the four sides. When we have a stress state determined by sigma 1 sigma 2 inside this yield surface failure does not occur. Failure occurs as soon as the stress state reaches or touches this yield surface that is when yielding will start to occur that is the meaning of the yield surface. This is in two dimensions with sigma 3 equal to 0 in the case of sigma 3 also being non-zero in the case of a multi axial stress state instead of a square yield surface we have a cubic yield surface. Again the surfaces are defined by the yield strength this surface for example is sigma 1 equals to y and so on. So, now again as long as the stress state is such that with sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 known the point is inside this cube then failure has not occurred yielding has not occurred. As soon as the point as stress increases reaches the yield surface then failure is said to occur. In the Tresca criterion or what is called the maximum shear stress criterion we give more importance to shear stress. This theory is based on the observations and this we have discussed extensively in previous lectures that in ductile materials slip occurs due to yielding this slip is provoked by shearing and therefore the Tresca criterion gives the maximum importance to the maximum shear stress. The criterion says that yielding occurs when the maximum shear stress under an arbitrary stress state reaches the value of the maximum shear stress at yield in uniaxial tension. So, we have to find out at what value the maximum shear stress will have at yielding under uniaxial tension and when the same maximum shear stress occurs under any arbitrary condition yielding is said to occur. Under uniaxial condition this will be the case sigma 1 is equal to y at yield sigma 2 sigma 3 are 0 remember this is uniaxial loading. So, now the shear stress or the maximum shear stress is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 that is half the yield strength. So, what we have said is when the maximum shear stress under any condition reaches this value then yielding will occur. Under multi axial loading now there are three possible shear stresses which can occur given by the difference half the differences between the different principal stresses. The maximum now will govern failure. So, linking these two we have now the Tresca criterion which says that failure will occur if any one of these conditions are satisfied sigma 2 minus sigma 3 is equal to plus minus y sigma 3 minus sigma 1 is equal to plus minus y sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is equal to plus minus y. And this is represented now by this yield surface for the Tresca criterion this is again for sigma 3 equal to 0 uh, plane stress situation. This surface comes from sigma 2 equal to y sigma 1 equal to y this is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 equal to y and so on. So, again as long as the stress state is inside this yield surface failure has not occurred and when the stress state reaches this yield surface yielding is set to start. The Tresca yield criterion gives good agreement with experimental results for most ductile materials and it is very simple, simple and therefore it is the most often used yield theory. The main objection or the limitation of this theory 
is that it ignores the effect of the intermediate principal stress. If you remember the shear stress only depends on two of the principal stresses. What is better is that we will uh, what we will look at now is the maximum distortional strain energy theory which predicts yielding slightly better than the Tresca theory, but the differences are not generally more than 15 percent. Tresca is more easy to apply a more exact theory would be that of the maximum distortional strain energy theory. This maximum distortional strain energy theory is called also the von Mises theory. Other names are the octahedral shear stress theory or the Huber Henke von Mises theory. In all these cases, we consider that yielding occurs when the distortional energy density reaches a value equal to the distortional energy density at yield in a uniaxial case. So, we find out what is the distortional energy density at yielding under uniaxial tension and when that same distortional energy density occurs in any other arbitrary state we consider that yielding occurs. Strain energy the total strain energy can be divided always into two parts a volumetric part and a distortional part u0 is the total strain energy given by this equation where sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 are the principal stresses e is the young's modulus and nu is the poisson ratio u0 can be divided into the volumetric energy and the distortional energy the volumetric energy is now what is giving a hydrostatic situation distortional energy is that corresponds to a change or a distortion in the shape uv as i said is the volumetric energy related to volume change under mean hydrostatic pressure under any arbitrary stress state there will always be a component that can be attributed to hydrostatic pressure the remaining or the other part is the distortion in energy related to the change in shape u v u sub v is equal to the sum of sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 squared divided by 18 k where k again is the bulk modulus given by this equation. The distortional energy is given by this equation the sum of the squares of the differences between the different principal stresses divided by 12 g where g is the shear modulus. So, we can see that this clearly is from the hydrostatic part and we know that hydrostatic pressure will not cause failure it only causes volumetric compression as the stress increases and we saw that shearing leads to slip and yielding and that is what is behind the distortional energy. So, let us see how to apply this criterion to failure. So, what we have said is the distortional energy density at uniaxial loading must first be determined. So, under uniaxial tension we have sigma 2 sigma 3 as 0 at yielding sigma 1 is equal to y. So, using the equation of the previous slide the distortional energy is given by y square divided by 6 g. So, what we have said is the distortional energy and any arbitrary stress state when it reaches this value yielding will occur. So, in a multi axial loading we say that this would be the equation this is set equal to this value and we get finally, this equation. So, this is the von Mises yield criterion failure through yielding. When we draw the failure surface we get this red line which circumscribes the yield surface that we had in the Tresca condition shown as the blue line. So, we find that they are very similar except that there is a slightly higher stress that can be taken before failure occurs 
given by the difference between the red line and the blue line. This is because we have not taken into consideration the volumetric part and we are only looking at the shear part. So, actually the stress that can be endured is slightly higher in some cases than what is given by the Tresca condition. We can also have failure that is occurring by other mechanisms such as fracture or cracking rather than just by yielding. For this we have to look at a failure theory called the Mohr Coulomb theory and for this again you have to revise the Mohr circles which you have studied in strength of materials and we know that a Mohr circle is a graphical representation of the stress state. If we consider a element given in figure A with sigma x, sigma y and tau x y as the known normal and shear stresses along a certain plane, we can now draw a Mohr circle fixing point A and B from the known values of sigma x, sigma y and tau x y and we can now draw this circle where the circle cuts the x axis, the normal stress axis are the principal stresses. Sigma 1 would be the maximum principal stress, sigma 2 would be the minimum principal stress and the value given by the top of the Mohr circle is the maximum shear stress. The y axis is gives the shear stress, the x axis gives the normal stresses. So, this would be the Mohr circle corresponding that element in this body. Failure is now taken to occur when the when we look at the Mohr circle at failure at a certain stress state. When we draw all the different Mohr circles at failure for this material and we take the envelope this is called the Coulomb failure envelope. We now assume that failure will occur when any Mohr circle touches this failure envelope. When the circle is smaller, then failure has not occurred, the stress state is such that failure is far from occurring and as the stress increases, this Mohr circle will become larger and larger and finally, it will touch the failure envelope, the Coulomb failure envelope which is taken linear and failure is then set to occur. We can determine this failure envelope through tests. For example, we have a material that is subjected to different confinement pressures. Say we take a, a cylinder or a core of some material and subject it to different confinement pressures that is sigma 3. This is the case where we have no confinement pressure, here you have 1000 mega Pascal confinement pressure and this is 5000 and then we increase the sigma 1, the axial pressure. Say sigma 3 is now the confinement pressure and now we are increasing under that confinement pressure the axial stress. In the case of 0 confinement, we have in this particular case a linear part and then a peak occurring at around 27 giga Pascal and then failure. So, this would be the sigma 1 at failure. So, this would be the sigma 1 at failure under this value of sigma 3. So, we repeat on an identical specimen a test with sigma 3 equal to 1000 mega Pascal and we again load axially keeping sigma 3 constant we are increasing sigma 1 and at failure we observe that the sigma 1 now is around 36 giga Pascal. Again another test is done we want to get at least 3 points to confirm the failure envelope. We now apply a confinement pressure of 5000 mega Pascals and we keep increasing sigma 1 the axial part and we find now that with higher confinement the 
failure now occurs at sigma 1 equal to 55 giga Pascals. So, we have now three sets of sigma 1, sigma 3 values at failure for this material. We have also seen that as confinement increases, we have a higher failure stress, failure axial failure stress and this is a concept that we use a lot in civil engineering. We confine a material to provide effectively for a higher load carrying capacity. A simple example is a concrete column with hoops or ties which confine the concrete and therefore increase its effective load carrying capacity. So, with tests like this we can construct the failure envelope and what we have done is use tests of the same material under different confinement pressures and axial stresses. We now draw the more circles for the cases represented by each of these tests. The failure stress is sigma 1. So, this is sigma 1 and this would be sigma 3 for the last test. For the test that we did at sigma 3 equal to 1000 mega Pascal, this would be the more circle and this would be the case where there was 0 confinement, sigma 3 is equal to 0. Now, we draw an envelope tangent to these more circle and this is now the failure envelope for the material that we have tested. So, this is a way that a failure envelope can be constructed for different materials. What we generally see is that instead of a straight line, the failure envelope is curved. Coulomb originally defined the failure envelope as a straight line, but later more showed that the slope decreases, slope decreases as the confinement pressure increases, that there is a flattening out of this curve and so you get a pinched response initially and a parabolic failure envelope and this is now called the more Coulomb failure envelope. What we also observe from this diagram is that the angle of the fracture plane, remember that this angle now tells us where how the failure will occur and as the confinement changes, this angle indicating the failure plane also changes. Okay. You see that when we look at the angle of the line joining the point which coincides with the failure envelope and the center of the Mohr circle, we find that this angle changes. This indicates that the failure plane changes its direction as the stress rate increases. Lastly, we should understand that there are different materials which have a varying failure mode as the stress rate increases or changes when the stress rate changes. Say in a brittle material like concrete or rock, we have to employ lot of varying failure theories. Sometimes these are empirical based or modified failure theories and one such failure theory or a combination of failure theories is shown on the figure on the left top, which is a composite failure envelope starting off with tensile failure criteria here. So, we could have a material failing under tension under very little confinement. Say in this case, we have a specimen which is subjected to compression, little bit of lateral tension and you can have splitting type failure, a tensile fracture occurring. Then with a little bit more confinement, you can have the behavior that we discussed earlier, the more parabolic failure criterion. This is this part where we have a change from the vertical splitting to shear type failure. This is called the transitional tensile fracture. You have a crack that is sliding and opening due to this stress state, some amount of compression or confinement. Then we have an area which is 
corresponding to the coulomb or straight line failure criteria. This is where we would have purely shear dominating the failure. There is some amount of uh, confinement here until in this case the confinement was very low. Here you have more significant confinement and you have shearing occurring. Then we have a brittle, tra brittle plastic transition going towards the von Mises yield criteria given by this diagram where we have shearing and some amount of plasticity indicated by the bulge. Then finally, we will have very high confinement leading to plastic type behavior where we can apply the von Mises plastic yield criteria. So, you have here the shear bands forming at 45 degrees and failure occurring with plastic yield. So, this obviously is a very complicated complex failure envelope which will require a lot of parameters to develop and something like this is needed when we want to cover different types of failures in brittle materials and other materials. We also see that the mode of failure in many materials such as concrete, rock, ceramics would change the type of failure or the failure mode changes with the confinement. So, to conclude we have looked in the previous lecture on how materials respond to stress and today we have looked at what sort of criteria we need to explain failure, to design for failure and to understand failure. And with this we have looked at the different mechanical properties of continuous media. So, in all these cases we are looking at materials which do not have any discontinuity. What we will do in the next lecture is look at fracture of materials where we look at discontinuities forming, defects becoming cracks and then the concept of stress and strain sort of breaks down. If uh, you remember from strength of materials and mechanics and what we looked at in the previous lecture also, stress and strain are defined at a point. Strain was the change in length divided by the original length and from that definition we can understand why the concept of stress and strain break down when there is a crack. If you um, can imagine a point which where you suddenly have a crack, the original length is 0 between the plane defined by my palms. Now, when you have a crack you suddenly have a displacement between them. So, there is a change in length whereas, the original length was almost 0. So, if you divide a finite change in length divided by a 0 original length you have an infinite strain. So, whenever there is a discontinuity or a crack you have infinite strains and what you will also see in the next lecture is you sometimes have infinite stresses. So, for, therefore, the concepts that we have discussed in the previous lecture and this where we looked at continuous media breaks down and we have to bring in the concepts of fracture mechanics that we will deal with in the next lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah.